Welcome everybody to the British Foreign Policy Group. My name is Sophia Gaston. I'm the director here. For those new to the BFPG, we're an independent think tank operating at this nexus between the domestic and the international spheres. We're exploring how best to build public consent for the Global Britain project. And I think we're very much an organization that reflects the scope of the two core projects at the heart of Britain's identity and our future direction at the moment. Both of these leveling up and, and global Britain agendas and the need to ensure that they're working in a complementary and not competitive way. We're delighted tonight to be hosting Tom Tugendhat, the Conservative MP for Tombridge and Morling, also the Chair of the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Select Committee. Tom served in the British Army until 2013, had an extremely distinguished military and intelligence career with his final position as the military assistant and principal advisor to the Chief of the Defence Staff. The Foreign Affairs Select Committee is primarily focused on scrutinizing the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and its associated bodies, but given the centrality of the Global Britain Project to this government, their work is impactful and deeply consequential to our political system as a whole, and so I would add critically important to Britain's future. So welcome, Tom. Very nice to be with you. So we're just going to have a discussion between Tom and I, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So to the audience, while Tom and I are speaking, please do submit your questions via the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. So let's kick it off talking about the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. So in your view, how has the pandemic shifted or sharpened the committee's priorities in terms of the areas that you're looking at and um, some of the relationships and issues um, at the heart of the Global Britain project that you might be examining. Well, Sophie, thank you very much. First of all, it's a pleasure to be with you and uh, talking about British foreign policy at this important time is, as you know, not really talking about foreign policy, but actually talking about ourselves. Uh, because foreign policy is, or at least should be, an expression of domestic policy in order to protect ourselves, but also uh, to uh, project influence. And that's exactly uh, what we're doing. And that's why actually this COVID uh, incident, as it were, has not just uh, shaped the way um, that we're seeing domestic policy, whether that's, you know, reorganisation of healthcare or, you know, uh, health hubs, but also how we work with others, because whether it's finding a vaccine, making sure such uh, cross-border spreads are halted at appropriate uh, moments, or uh, actually uh, looking to hold, uh, looking to find different ways of partnering around the world so that we're not fully dependent on one uh, country that doesn't share our values, and I'm sure we'll come back to the China question later, so I'll stop there. But this is all sharpening, I would say, our work, because the last two or three years we've really been looking, as, as you know, at uh, Britain's dependence on autocratic states and how we deal with autocracies. So the Global Britain Project is obviously an effort for us to be active and engaged and outward looking in the world. And I do think that there is a, a common understanding that at its heart, it is about Britain being a very active member of the global community. But um, there have already been challenges for some time, of course, at the center of this around building public consent for that vision. And obviously during the pandemic, with our priorities sort of shifting inward and very much focusing in a domestic sphere, borders closing and so on. Do you think that that case of um, promoting openness and connectivity, that that task becomes more difficult in the aftermath of the pandemic? Or do you actually take a more optimistic view? Do you think that the pandemic has shown us how much we need to work together? You see, I think it's taken the second of those. I, I'm, I'm by nature an optimist, you can't be a soldier, and you can't be a politician without being an optimist. And, and I, think, um, I, I think the world is looking at cooperation in a different way. Now, the reason I say in a different way is because the sort of blanket openness that the WTO seeks, for example, or um, uh, you know, the UN aspires to is clearly uh, facing challenges. And the idea that the international system as a system is uh, of itself, um, you know, the sort of the Valhalla, the, 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 the paradise aim for everyone. I think that has taken a knock. But the idea of international cooperation, the cooperation between nation states as the fundamental building block of the international order, I think that actually has been reinforced. So, you know, we've seen and in our own 
uh, neighborhood, you know, in the European Union, we've seen real challenges to uh, cross-border cooperation within the EU. You know, we saw, for example, medical supplies being stopped from being exported from some countries to others, even within the EU. And we've seen, you know, challenges to the World Health Organization uh, and the World Health en Assembly. But what we've also seen, uh, you know, at the same time, we've seen much greater cooperation on um, you know, vaccine research. We've seen Taiwan supplying uh, medical equipment and supplies to the UK. We've seen, uh, you know, Japan and Singapore sharing best practice on track and trace. You know, we've seen a whole series of different forms, if you like, bilateral internationalism, creating a networked effect rather than a sort of centralized effect around international bodies. And I think, I think there's an interesting shift here uh, in uh, internationalism, which is recognizing the nation state uh, as the building block, but also uh, recognizing the importance of international cooperation. And I think that does speak to the heart of this challenge, I suppose, for the Conservative Party being the ones presiding over this Global Britain project and obviously trying to bring the country together after a very divisive period. Um, one of the things that has become clear is that this idea of sort of unfettered globalization, um, that the narrative around that had become um, I suppose quite an insecure proposition for a lot of people. So how would you consider that we go about this task of securitizing openness? How do we convince people who are fearful and hold many genuine concerns about, um, I suppose, the idea of a much more connected world order and their place within it? How do we, I suppose, make the case for the strength and the safety of a nation state in a globalized world? Well, I think one of the interesting things that we're looking at at the moment is something that I see in my post bag, uh, as it were, well, virtual post bag anyway. Um, many of the emails and letters that come to uh, a politician at the moment, come to an MP at the moment, are either extremely local, what to do about a pothole or a road or a village issue, or they're hyper, uh, multinational, you know, what to do about climate change or so on. Very few things hit the national level in an odd way. Very few things are actually at the UK level. Quite a lot of things are at the you know, ultra local or Kent level. And quite a lot of things are at the, you know, global or European level. Now, that's a real challenge for uh, organisations in our world. But I do think that it, you know, your question speaks to a fundamental element that, that the challenges of the last few years are leading people to believe quite reasonably that one of the roles of government is protection, protection from pandemic, protection from terrorism, protection from uh, unfair trade practices, from any number of different things. Now, that doesn't mean that people are protectionist in the old sense, as in you know, putting up tariff walls and all the rest of it, but it does mean that people expect the government to cooperate with others to protect them from uh, or, to, or to avert the dangers of things like climate change and, uh, and global pandemics. So I think actually people are, uh, you know, globally cooperative, if you like, but they also are rooted in a real understanding of where they're from. I mean, I'm sit sitting here in this house, which was built um, uh, about 500 years ago, um, in, a, in a community that has, a, has very, very deep roots of understanding of itself. You know, Kent was a kingdom uh, in and of itself up until uh, the 8900s. So, you know, even small areas of what is now the United Kingdom have very rooted identities. And the same is, of course, true around the world. You know, we, we used to talking about ourselves in the local and others in the national. And of course, that's not true. Others are also local. So that, that blend is something that we've got to manage. Coming back to the work of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, I suppose one of the big uh, central focuses is, of course, this integrated review of our security development, um, defense and foreign policy that's been uh, sort of somewhat postponed uh, because of the pandemic, although it's sort of poofing along in the background. Um, whether or not the public appetite or the political will will be there for us to be open and connected and engaged in the world, one thing that will be impossible to avoid is the new constraints on resources in the aftermath of the pandemic, because obviously the Exchequer is taking a huge hit from this 
uh, pandemic and, and obviously the necessary support that needs to be provided um, domestically at this time. There are a lot of people concerned in the foreign policy community about what that means for the review and I suppose the ambitions at the heart of its scope. Um, do you think these are genuine concerns? Um, and I suppose is this also a time for thinking about how we do more with less? Well, doing more with less is, is kind of the mantra of every government ever. So I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go on to that. But, you know, there are legitimate concerns here. Of course, there are legitimate concerns that this is going to be a, a, a you know, a cash informed review rather than a strategy informed review. But it needn't be because actually the kind of strategic outlook we're talking about needn't have huge price tags attached. If what you're genuinely looking to do is burden share, if what you're actually looking to do is cooperate, then the key asset in your armory is people. It's uh, diplomats and uh, you know, business people and scientists and aid workers who are willing to go around the world and cooperate. So these days that budget will be uh, a little bit lower because they don't have to travel as much as we're all doing this on Zoom. Uh, or whatever it is, uh, other other platforms that are available. The um, it's uh, it's about that engagement, and I think this is an area where the UK really is still uh, at a massively uh, you know advantageous position, and we really can uh, make a difference because fundamentally, what the UK sells, if you like, in a sort of strategic sense, is we sell ideas and we sell um, you know we sell. Uh, uh, rules, if you like. We sell a, a buy-in to, to an ordered world. And some of those rules are through accountancy and some of those are through diplomacy. But, you know, fundamentally, it's a structured world through a, a, set, of, uh, a set of principles. And that's what, we're, that's what we're offering. Now, I think we can do that by investing uh, properly in a, a foreign office that actually has a strategy and actually has a, a, a plan that it's trying to work to, uh, rather than simply uh, trying out, go out there just to be nice and friendly to folk. You know, there's not much point in that. What there is a point in is, is promoting uh, the values that really do make the British and many other people prosperous uh, and safe. One of the big areas of concern, which also falls into the purview of, of your select committee is, uh, of course, the future of the British Council, yeah. which is under extreme pressure at the moment um, in terms of its funding and, and its ongoing settlement. Uh, there are a lot of people who are especially worried about this because I suppose there is an idea that, uh, especially in the wake of Brexit and as we imagine what our new role is going to be in the world, that soft power is actually more critical than ever. Um, how important are institutions like the British Council going to be in the aftermath of the pandemic for Britain and also more broadly in the Global Britain project in terms of projecting who we are into the world? Well, I think they're hugely important and they're hugely important because of many of the different services, as it were, that they offer. Some of those are educational, some of those are cultural. But the fundamental thing that they're offering is understanding, understanding of what we're trying to project. You know, unlike uh, many other countries at many different times in, in the past few centuries, we are not trying to project force. You know, we're not trying to control people. What we're trying to do is to build up a series of principles and a network of rules that actually allows people to prosper uh, on their own terms and in their own way. Now, that is a very unusual thing to be selling bizarrely. And therefore, it requires uh, you know, some, some understanding and some education as to why we're doing it. Now, there's a huge role for the council in that, because actually, one of, the, one of the basic ways of starting that process of education is through education. And we already know that the UK is a centre of education, because people come here from abroad. And you know, our universities are very heavily subscribed from uh, foreign students. So that's, you know, that's already something that we are uh, extremely conscious of. But we're also conscious that um, that's going to change, right? I mean, the, the nature of international travel, we don't know what it's going to be in September, but it's unlikely to be exactly the same as it was last September. And therefore, the role of the council in perhaps helping to run sort of neutral examination centres, or at least, uh, you know, to, to share influence within countries, uh, and to pre provide a platform for many of our, of our educational centres is going to be, I think, a growing one. Now, I know that there are financial issues that the uh, council has had with the foreign office and it won't surprise you to hear that i and many others have been in touch with the treasury and uh, the foreign office about this i mean of course as an arm of government that 
it's not it's not going to run out of money in that sense um, but it nor does it keep reserves in the way that a private business would so this is a, a difficult time uh, admittedly so let's turn on to some of the big relationships that your committee uh, is exploring um, let's start with a uh, big regional neighbor, the European Union. Uh, there's obviously been a very fractious uh, debate around this, but I suppose there is a hope that particularly in the wake of the pandemic, there might be a bit of space on the other side of some kind of agree you know, withdrawal agreement and a, a, a deal that we could start to talk a little bit more strategically about our relationship with Europe. What are some of the issues you think would be helpful for us to think of in a regional manner about cooperation with the EU and particularly thinking about the EU obviously trying to start to move towards a more confident positioning of itself as a global power. So I think there's a really interesting uh, issue to deal with the EU th that we've really got to address and this is this is a fundamental failure sadly of both sides uh, of the talks which is you know both sides as it were have seen the talks as an end in itself in some way, rather than just simply another stage on a 2000 year relationship between people on these islands and people uh, on the mainland. And, and in, instead of looking at this as a stage, looking at it as, uh, as simply as a, a, as a waypoint, instead of doing that, what we've, what we've done is we've ramped up this talk so that it is almost an end in itself. Now that has made it very difficult for both parties to move because the correct thing for both parties to do is to recognize that like a like a divorcing couple we want to find a way that we can both go to the kids wedding in 20 years time as friends and not simply be arguing about who owned which cd uh, when we get there in 20 years time right but in order to do that we've got to focus on the things that matter and this is where we come to your question what can we do together really together well trade is the first one yeah, we are going to trade in a different way. That's quite clear. And, you know, many of us wish that we weren't building obstacles, but that's a choice that's been made. And there's literally no point in going over old arguments again. So how do we trade with 27 of our nearest partners and friends in a way that works for all of us? How do we try and build up that relationship rather than seeing this obstacle as though it's an end in itself? Uh, secondly, the environment. We know that many European people not just us, but Ireland, Germany, France, any number of others, have a huge interest in making sure that we protect our natural environment at home, but also uh, how it is influenced from abroad. Look, we, we share a border with the European Union and the environmental policies that are conducted in the Republic of Ireland have a direct effect on us here in the United Kingdom as they affect, you know, Lochfoyle and, uh, and, 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 uh, and Ulster. You know, it, it, it just does. And the truth is that what the French put into the water or the Germans or the Dutch or whatever put into the water ends up in the, uh, in the English Channel, just as what we put in the, in the water ends up on their beaches. You know, this matters to all of us. So that's another area where we can really look at cooperation. And then, you know, a third and very obvious one is, look, there are real challenges around the world. And we know, for example, that bringing in students from some countries has not just imported uh, some of their, um, you know, some, some money bluntly and some ideas, but also censorship and some of the more authoritarian values that those countries seek to export. Now, we know that most of our European partners don't do that. So again, a free exchange of education, uh, you know, which doesn't necessarily have to be through the EU, but, you know, between ourselves, would seem like a very sensible place to go, because actually, we do have similar ideas, uh, not just of uh, you know, scientific uh, research, but also of uh, concepts of patents and things like that, that enable us to partner very easily. And it would seem, it would be silly to throw, as it were, the baby out with the bathwater just because we're going through a rather turbulent divorce. So turning to our other big partner, the United States, it's obviously been a more turbulent time. Um, President Trump's choices, um, particularly around multilateral institutions um, and the sort of, I suppose, the sanctity of the liberal world order have obviously created some challenges. Uh, it's particularly challenging for Britain as we try and work out what role we're going to play in the world because our own Western alliance is in a period of fragmentation. How much 
weight would you give the distinction of a Biden victory to our ongoing relationship with the United States? Do you fundamentally see this is something that's really, it's about a country to country relationship. It's really about the people behind the scenes. The fundamentals are still there. Or do you think that the turbulence under President Trump would end with the Biden presidency? It's, it's very hard to be certain. And, and I certainly wouldn't predict the result, by the way, just this far out. I wouldn't rule out Trump. Uh, and I wouldn't, uh, well, and I certainly wouldn't be confident of his victory either. It's, it's, I think it's far too early to tell. But I think what's interesting is actually the continuity in US policy. It's very interesting when you, when you look at the reactions to China, for example, and you, and you hear it as though it's, a, a, as though it's Trump rhetoric. And you, it's worth remembering that actually this is one of the few issues that Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump agree on almost totally, right? This is, this is not just bipartisan, it's, it's kind of universal. And when you look at the policies that actually um, Trump has brought in, uh, President Trump has brought in on responses to uh, Chinese trade practices. Many of them were begun or trialed or, you know, or at least planned for uh, uh, in the Obama White House. You know, it, it is not surprising that the Obama White House, the Obama administration changed its policies over eight years, kind of the, the, the world evolved over eight years, right? And the last year or two of the Obama administration, the NSE was beginning to look at many of the things that the Trump administration has now put in. And actually, some of the people are the same. Uh, uh, you know, I've spoken to some of them. And, you know, when, when they speak to other countries about their concern at this sort of, you know, the pe people see of sort of the, the Trump attitude to the world, some of these guys point out quite reasonably, look, these are policies we were planning under Obama. Um, and it's worth remembering that, you know, the United States has not traditionally been a particularly interventionist power. I mean, it, that has been different, uh, obviously, since the Second World War. Um, uh, and various pre presidents have tried to reverse that uh, to be more uh, uh, continental uh, rather than globalist. Um, but they keep getting dragged out. You know, George W. Bush tried to be more continental, but 9-11 happened. Uh, and, and so this isn't, this isn't solely Trump. And I suspect that many of these policies would continue in some way under Biden, even if the tone was different. You mentioned China there. This is obviously uh, the big geopolitical question at the moment, obviously predating the pandemic, but I think the pandemic has obviously focused minds. Um, we are now going into a process of reviewing the decision to allow Huawei to be involved in the bidding process around the infrastructure of our 5G network. We can presume that will necessarily extend the scope of such a review to other areas of critical infrastructure, including nuclear power and so on. Public opinion has hardened to quite an extraordinary place where there doesn't even seem to be much consent for us to even have a kind of economic relationship with China. I mean, it's the, the attitudes towards China are in a similar place as our attitudes towards countries like Iran and North Korea for whom we have economic sanctions. So it's, it's really in a strange place at the moment. And obviously there's going to have to be a whole process of, of um, building and winning public opinion around a new relationship with China. So how would you conceive that strategic relationship? What should be the bounds of that relationship? Do you still see a role for a healthy economic and cultural exchange with China? Or do you think that we actually need to be even more hawkish? So I think it's worth looking at China full in the face and realizing what we're dealing with. First of all, we're not talking about just China. We're talking about the Chinese Communist Party. You know, China's place in the world is quite clear. It is to be a major global power setting and sharing values with all of us. You know, Pen Chun Chang, who was the diplomat who wrote quite a lot of the uh, sections about individual rights in the UN Charter, in the 1940s is one of the founding fathers of our global internationalist system. He is one of the people who embedded into countries around the world uh, values and individual rights that are now being violated on a daily basis in, uh, by Beijing governments. So 
the role of China and the role of the Chinese Communist Party are not the same thing. And we've got to be quite clear that we differentiate the two because, you know, the great win for the world will be to have Chinese scientists and Chinese business people, you know, and Chinese students and, and, and everybody playing their part in the world in a free and fair way. But what we're seeing out of the Chinese Communist Party is something different. And, and the essential difference is the fact that it's a communist dictatorship, not the fact that it's Chinese. So that the focus should be really on the, on, on the communist bit, not on the Chinese bit. And what we're seeing there is we're seeing a form of Leninist nationalism, which uh, General Secretary Xi has written about a lot, actually, since 2012, and indeed a little bit before. And so it shouldn't really come as a surprise to us, but for some reason, many people have been uh, surprised by what we're seeing. Because what we're seeing is actually something that has been signaled long, long ago, which is a form of uh, erosion of the international network of partnerships in favor of a binary relationship between Beijing and a uh, semi-vassal state. And that is the real challenge that we've got. Because actually, you know, the best relationship for all of us is to have China part of every conversation. We really should have China part of every conversation. You, know, you can't talk about environmentalism without talking about China. You can't talk about uh, civil rights, employment law. You can't talk about trade. You can't, you know, the, the list of subjects with which you've got to have a conversation with China is huge. The trouble is that at the moment, the, the Chinese government is trying uh, to undermine the international cooperation that makes those possible. Now, you know, it's not for us to decide how the Chinese people are governed, uh, though I suspect that free people wouldn't choose dictatorship. They don't tend to, uh, as we saw in uh, the early 90s in Europe, and we've seen elsewhere that when people are given uh, the opportunity of a free press and free assembly and free elections, they don't tend to choose uh, the level of state control that we're seeing in Xinjiang and now, sadly, emerging into Hong Kong. It's not for us to determine that. What we've got to do is we've got to engage with China where we can and resist the attempts to undermine our values and our interests. And that means standing with countries around the region. Look, we can partner with South Korea and Japan and India, but we can also partner with countries in Africa and South America where Chinese debt diplomacy is seeking to exert influence on our international organizations and on those countries. And that's where global Britain can start to mean something. I mean, at the moment, those two words are empty and we need to fill them. And the way that we fill them is to make ourselves an enabler uh, into a new networked world that actually has values and stands for them, not simply like the WTO, a body that has now lost all teeth that now that the appellate body is no longer quarrant and that establishes standards at such at the lowest possible denominator so frankly it's largely irrelevant that's why we need actually to be global britain so i just want to go to questions from the audience now and we've had such a large number of them i'm going to actually bring some of them together that are in similar themes and actually uh, there's quite a few that pick up just on the point you would uh, starting to get into there around the future of our multilateral institutions. So it seems to me that Trump uh, fundamentally doesn't believe in the value of imperfect institutions. Um, there has been a lot of validity to some of the claims that he's put forward and obviously you mentioned the WTO there. How should we be thinking about the future of these institutions? Is reform possible? Um, and you mentioned that we should be keeping China involved in the conversations. How do we make sure that we're also actually holding them to account of the standards of these institutions? Okay, I think that's, there's a range of points there, and I think they're entirely valid. I, I'm not actually hugely critical of Trump's, President Trump's analysis of many of these institutions. He's right that the World Health Organization has had real problems in holding China to account. By the way, I could list a number of other institutions that are also really struggling uh, with their, you know, the, the way that they're governed. The UN Human Rights Council is another quite egregious example, and UNESCO has got various other issues. But actually, this reminds me of um, 
the importance that Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan set to these institutions. They didn't tolerate any non-democratic state sitting on UN bodies if they could possibly help it. Now, they didn't always succeed. Of course, they didn't. But they fought for every seat in every international body. Because the truth is, however badly you think things are going when you're at the table, if you walk away, trust me, it will go worse for you. And these bodies exist. They have a legitimacy, even if the only legitimacy they have is to create headlines. Most of them have a bit more legitimacy than that. And so given that they have a legitimacy, given that they exist, the reality is that we should invest in them. You know, the top three donors to the WHO are the United States, the Gates Foundation, and the United Kingdom. China's donations in historic terms are, are actually relatively low, so we shouldn't be abandoning the ground. And the real truth, sadly, uh, of uh, other countries' success in shaping and influencing these bodies is not that they've exerted huge power, it's that we have refused to exert any ourselves. There's been a general feeling since the 19, early 1990s that the liberal international order has won, the Fukuyama essay, as it were, has seeped into too many capitals and we've ceased to fight for the values that we claim uh, to, to promote. Now that actually is leaving our people uh, exposed in these bodies, whether it's in world trade or whether it's in uh, or whether it's in human rights or any number of different things. And it's now beginning to matter. And so the reality is we've got to wake up. If you look, for example, at how China is seeking to use the International Telecoms Union, uh, a rather geeky organization uh, of folk interested in wiggly amps and frequencies, the reality is what they're trying to do with it is to use it to rewrite the internet from a sort of a, a distributed network of um, uncontrollable and uncontrolled nodes into a centralized uh, state-based uh, network that allows, funnily enough, autocratic states like China, Russia, Venezuela to control what goes on. Now, if we do not seek to influence back, we're going to wake up in 20 years' time and find out that the internet that allowed everything from Zoom and Facebook uh, to, you know, whatever, shopping sites and dating sites, will have changed into an organ of state control. And that's why this is a real challenge that we've got to address now. And the key to it is getting back in there, getting back in the fight, remembering that all these positions matter. You know, it's extraordinary that the UK, for the first time since the court was founded, does not have a judge on the International Court of Justice. It's astonishing absolutely astonishing. You know, the UK is known for a few things around the world, and one of them is our judges and our law, right? This is something that people literally come from around the world to buy into our courts process. And who beat us to that position? Lebanon. Now, Lebanon's a great country, and I'm sure the guy who got the seat is absolutely highly qualified and is you know, going to do the job well. That's not what I'm arguing. How much foreign aid does Lebanon give? How many embassies does Lebanon have? How many times did Lebanon ask people for their vote in the General Assembly that mattered? Now, the first two questions, we win hands down. The third, Lebanon wins on. And that's why they won. They actually campaigned. And anybody who has done any democratic uh, event at all, whether it's a local council or an international organization, knows that if you want people to vote for them, You've got to ask them. It's the first thing you've got to do. You've got to ask them. And we have not been effective enough and strategic enough in getting votes, not just for ourselves, but also for like-minded partner nations to make sure that these organizations actually reflect the values that we know matter. I completely agree. I think that our uh, immense capacities for governance and regulation and standards is such a crucial part of our soft power and we don't seem to make enough of it. Um, I, and I suppose this comes to a, a bunch of different questions we've been getting through about, I guess this, this central question about how Britain articulates and imagines its role in the world. Um, obviously I'm, I'm getting some questions through from various partisan and viewpoints on this, but I think it does come to this central question around confidence. And you just mentioned there a sort of lack of kind of strategic thinking in some of these diplomatic negotiations um, and power maneuvers. How do you think we can restore that confidence 
to our global footprint? You know, is this, does this stem from, is there something structural within the FCO? Is there, or is it actually a more intangible thing? Or, or is it actually that we just need to link up our departments more effectively? What, what's the source of our lack of confidence? Well, I, I think all of this starts, you know, all of this starts from the top. You know, you've got to believe in what you're doing. You've got to fundamentally believe that Britain is or can be a force for good in the world and that our interest, the promotion of the happiness and security and prosperity of the British people is fundamentally in the interests of the entire world. Now, I happen to believe that, by the way, and I, I believe it because I think actually what British people want, which is broadly speaking, a free and open trading environment with which you can travel, you know, where you can travel around the world and you can do various, uh, various things as safely as possible, is actually in the interest of everybody. I think it's just as much as in, in the interest of Venezuelans and Russians and Chinese people as it is in the interest of Brits and French and Americans and Australians. I don't, I don't see why it's not in the interest of everybody. But you've got to believe that in order to want to promote it. And in order to then promote it, you've got to make sure that your embassy network, your businesses, everything that sort of ex you know, comes out of the UK, your, your, your troops, your, your aid workers, you know, share at least the idea that what they're trying to do is to improve the world for everyone. And part of that is by securing the position of the UK within it. Now, I, I think we can do it, but there is certainly a, a defensive crouch that some people have, a sort of a, a perception, as it were, that the world is unfair and out to get them, and what they really need to do is pull up the drawbridge. And you see this form of nationalism in uh, various different communities that they've been, you know, they've got a they got a rough deal from either the UK or they've got a rough deal from the EU or they've got a rough deal from the UN or they've got a rough deal from WHO. And therefore, the correct thing is to you know, pull up the drawbridge. No, the correct thing is to reinvest and to shape the world around you because you can do it. You know, when you look at when you look at the, 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 the pattern, by the way, of influence of the UK, when we have put our minds to it, when we have actually wanted to achieve something, we've done it. We wrote, the British wrote the European Convention on Human Rights. That is basically British law on privacy, on human rights, on you know, freedom of elections and various things, forced onto a defeated Europe in 1947. It was written by conservative politicians, ironically, later conservative attorney general, and forced on Europeans. We're the only country where a withdrawal from the ECHR would change nothing because it's British law. If other countries withdrew from it, it would change quite a lot because actually it's not fundamental legal practice in many European countries, but it is fundamental in the UK. It wouldn't change anything if we left. It would still be written into British law. The same is true if you look at the other organisations. You know, the single market in Europe was a British creation. The UN law of the sea was a British creation. You know, a lot of these things, admittedly they were created, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, were British creations either directly or in partnership with others. And sometimes they were British creations, you know, through others. And many of the Australian uh, developments are, you know, part of a British core. Yes, they're Australian. Of course, they're Australian because it's, it's now a different cultural route, but, but it's still from the same stem. And we're seeing a lot of that, you know, in terms of defending, for example, uh, national observer status at the World Health Assembly. You know, we're seeing Australia really taking a very important role in continuing what I think fundamentally uh, forces for good, not, not in the sense they're just British because you know, they've got a Union Jack on them, but they're British in the sense they share the cultural values of individual rights, of uh, the rule of law, of freedom of expression and many other things. So we have quite a few questions around what our relationship should be or our role should be in Asia Pacific. I suppose uh, this is there. There are people who are interested in thinking about that sort of China dimensions of that, but also thinking about other partnerships that we could be developing there. You've touched a little on, um, you know, uh, South Korea and Japan and some of the other potential partners in the region. We've obviously got one of our strongest allies, Australia, there on the front line. Um, I'm thinking. Uh, from reading these questions, there's quite a lot of interest in obviously the Hong Kong question as well. 
And I think people are wondering whether or not we should be increasing our military presence in this region, whether we should be getting much more involved in these questions around freedom of, of navigation, South China Sea. Um, do you think that Britain should be an active player in the Asia Pacific region? Not only do I think we should be, in many ways we are, whether we like it or not. You know, we have some fundamental interests in the Asia Pacific region, whether, as you rightly say, talking about uh, freedom of navigation operations that Her Majesty's ships have been conducting uh, at various points you know, in the last 10, 20 years, uh, or indeed in uh, promoting trade in the area. Um, you know, we have a fundamental stake in there. And, and that stake is not just because, you know, most of the world's maritime insurance is done in London and therefore, you know, it's fundamental to our economy. It's because actually we are at the heart of a networked trading world and trade matters that much more to us than it does to many, many other countries. We've always been an outward trading nation in a way that some other countries have been more inward. Now, that means that we are fundamentally more tied to the abroad. So whether it's the five parties defense agreement that sadly, for a long time, we, we really pulled back from, we're now beginning to reinvest a bit, but we not nearly enough for my liking, or whether it's looking at really deepening the alliance with countries like Japan, where we share huge uh, shared values, as it were, of, uh, you know, we're both island nations just off a major, Euro, uh, you know, major continental land mass. We both have very internationalist uh, companies. Okay, we're about half the size in demographic terms, but we both have uh, real challenges that, uh, you know, as sort of, if you like, non-hegemonic powers. You know, we've got, we've got real opportunities to exchange ideas and to partner very, very closely. Uh, and I think we should be investing highly in that. But we should also be investing in countries like South Korea, and most importantly, perhaps, uh, in India. You know, in countries like India and Pakistan, where you know, not all of our history is good, let's not pretend, but where we do have a very deep historic relationship, and we actually have what... Prime Minister Modi calls a living bridge between our peoples. You know, building on that living bridge, like sort of London Bridge, the old London Bridge, where you have houses over the river, building on that living bridge and making it uh, not just a, a, you know, not just a historic legacy, but a modern opportunity is exactly what we should be doing. And, you know, we demonstrate that as conservatives that, uh, you know, that is fundamental to who we are as Brits. You know, that background of having uh, a Muslim, uh, a Hindu, a Sikh, uh, and many other diasporas in the UK that come uh, from India, and in fact, a very deep link of British companies in India and Pakistan, very deep military partnership as well, is something that really gives us all an opportunity and I think offers us a huge strength, but it, it requires investment. I mean, I come back to a point I made earlier. It requires belief. Do you believe that this is worth doing? Because if you don't, you are going to go around the world apologizing and cutting back on embassies that look too grand and pretending that you're not a great power. And if you do, then you won't be ashamed when your ambassador drives a Rolls Royce and, and, and lives in a, a decent house. Not because these are palaces, but because you want people to see that you are respecting them. It's like, you know, it's like wearing a suit when you go to a meeting, right? We're all on Zoom now, so we're all, we're all dressed down. But you wear a suit to go to a meeting, not to make yourself look good, but to show that you respect the other person you're, you're going to meet, right? And the same is true of our embassy network. The point about having ambassadors in decent cars and able to, to you know, host people in nice embassies is not to make the ambassador feel good. I mean, I, mean, I know many good ambassadors and I'm delighted if they do, but that's frankly not the point. The point is to show that the country that we're in, that this is a country that we respect, that we value, and that Britain is investing in. That's why we have the cars, that's why we have the houses, that's why we have the budgets to entertain and to make people feel valued. Because it promotes our interest, it promotes that partnership. You can only do it if you believe in it. If you don't believe in it, forget it. We've had quite a few questions obviously coming through around the China Research Group, which uh, you have obviously founded within the Conservative Party it's a group of MPs coming together to, I suppose, try and um, advocate for a stronger, more coherent uh, line on our relationship with China. Um, I think there's, there's quite a few questions coming through about the role of cross-party cooperation on this, particularly with the new leadership in, in the Labour Party. 
You mentioned earlier about the extraordinary degree of cross-party consensus, bipartisan support in the United States. Do you think that this is something that we could be achieving here in Britain? Do you think that would be advantageous? And is there actually a need for a group kind of like the CRG, but something that could be cross-party in nature to bring together voices to work collaboratively on, on this kind of issue? Yes, there is. And the reality is that actually the CRG is, is pretty bipartisan. Uh, the reality is it's a conservative group because it's for very bureaucratic reasons. It was easier to set it up like that. But it won't surprise you at all to hear uh, that Stephen Kinnock um, and I share very similar views, and he's the Labour spokesman uh, on uh, Asia now. Now, you know, that wasn't possible when we were beginning to talk about it, because at that time, the Corbyn administration uh, seemed rather more uh, keen on communists than it was on um, uh, liberties. So it didn't quite work. But you're right, under the new Labour administration, it appears that that is uh, an avenue that we can uh, certainly work on. And, you know, we are already in talks about how we, you know, how, how we evolve. The challenge for all of us in this bipartisan nature is not to, uh, however, is not to lower our ambitions, but to challenge each other to do better. And, you know, it won't surprise you to hear that uh, I think that promoting um, business relationships is hugely important in this. And, you know, this is why one of the questions you touched on earlier and I didn't cover was about Hong Kong. You know, defending the joint declaration that we signed all those years ago and is supposed to last now until 20. 47, another 27 years, is not just about uh, defending a legacy that we signed up to. It's about defending a present that we live in. And that present is about international cooperation. It's about businesses in Hong Kong. It's about a partnership between peoples. And that, if we're not willing to do it in Hong Kong, a country, sorry, a, a territory within which we have a huge shared uh, history, then it does raise questions about what we're willing to do uh, around the world. And that's where I think, actually, you know, though I certainly would never advocate anybody voted Labour, I do welcome uh, Labour's uh, challenge to us on Hong Kong. And I hope very much that the government uh, sees that in, in the spirit with which it's intended. You know, what Lisa Nandy has been doing there in challenging uh, Foreign Secretary Rob, uh, I think is important. We've had a few questions about the role of the BBC World Service. I suppose this is within the domain we were speaking about earlier regarding the British Council. And uh, I agree that uh, the BBC World Service is an enormous tool of our strategic soft power. Um, how do you think we should be investing more in the BBC World Service? And do you think we need to be reimagining its relationship with the FCO? I mean, should there be a much closer relationship? Should we be more overt in saying this is one of the most important tools of soft power that we actually have and we should be actually making the most of it and, and bringing in some more strategic control? Uh, so I think there's two elements there. The first is yes we should be making more of it but no we shouldn't be bringing it more under control. Uh, the, the great strength of the BBC is um, I will complain about it as much as anybody else and yet I'm an advocate that it should be more invested in. And the reason is the BBC World Service, it really is the world's independent news source. You know, we know this, you can see this on the figures, it doesn't matter which country you're looking at and which language service you're looking in. You know, the BBC World Service really is uh, a global source of independent news and that is hugely powerful. Now, I think it's important that it doesn't promote Britain, but it does promote freedom of expression, and uh, the kind of internationalism that we're talking about. Because those are fundamentally in Britain's interest, even when it's critical of Britain. Those are the strategic messages, as it were, that free people should have free rights of free association, free speech and, 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 and business and any other thing. Those are so fundamentally in Britain's interest that even when um, you know, the BBC is critical of the United Kingdom, which it quite frequently is, um, it is still it to our advantage that uh, th that organization exists and promotes those values. So I wouldn't bring it under control in any way or other, you know, except in the, in the most, you know, in the loosest financial sense. Um, but I certainly would make sure that it had the ability to resource what is now a changing media environment in many languages and was able to broadcast uh, in sub-regional languages in many countries because actually seeking to promote um, information into sub-regional identities 
I think is also hugely important. Yes, well, I've certainly been in plenty of Central and Eastern European hotel rooms where the only English language is, is production is actually uh, Russia Today in English, which is um, quite extraordinary. Um, just on that point, actually, around Russia, uh, we've had a few questions in around um, this question of how we should be thinking about and engaging with Russia, because I suppose all the tensions have sort of in a way dissipated away, moved away from Russia. Every, all eyes are on China now, and, and that's sort of the focus of our sort of strategic rivalry. Um, do you think that Russia, we should still be very actively considering Russia as a present um, ongoing and even growing threat? Uh, and how would you assess the potential of a Russian-Chinese kind of strategic relationship which we're starting to see emerging in some sectors? Well, first of all, yes, I think Russia still poses a, a major challenge to us. Uh, and actually the, the, the faltering economy that will follow the COVID crisis is likely to do very severe damage uh, to Russia's internal cohesion. And we are likely to see um, President Putin seeking to externalize that problem in the usual way, which is by invading one of his neighbors. Uh, he's already done it to Georgia and Ukraine, and uh, there's no reason not to expect him to do it uh, somewhere else. So I don't think that that challenge has gone, and I do think we should remain extremely alert to it, uh, as well as, of course, to the uh, challenges of misinformation and um, uh, influence operations that, that we're seeing around the world. You know, we did see, for example, we saw, um, we've seen the evolution of Russian influence uh, from, um, you know, murdering unknown Russians uh, at home, to murdering Russians abroad, to overtly murdering Russians abroad, like the Skripals, to now uh, with the attack on the uh, mayor of Prague, I believe it was, I have to confirm that, um, you know, direct attacks on foreign politicians who challenge Russians' view of the world. So, you know, we are seeing an increasingly uh, aggressive Russia, though in very limited ways. And we're seeing that because actually, you know, President Putin is fundamentally weak and leading a weakening system. And so in order to sort of pretend he's stronger than he is, like a Potemkin prince, he is, uh, he, he's ramping up the violence. Uh, but the idea of a Russian-Chinese cooperation, I've always found uh, not strategically sound. Russia will try to do it because it's trying to secure its east. But the reality is China is uh, eating up Russia's, you know, breakfast, lunch and dinner in the East. And, and it's certainly clear uh, if, you, uh, if you look at towns in uh, Eastern Russia that they are increasingly Sinified. Um, and you are seeing uh, that the Russian population is diminishing and the Chinese population is expanding. So, you know, Russia, Russia's partnership may well not last quite as long as those in Moscow think it will. And it's quite clear that uh, China's idea of that partnership uh, is, is rather more one of vassalage than of partnership. Well, I promise we would finish on time. So uh, we will wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Tom. You've been so generous with your time and uh, it's a very intense thing to do. I know you've had an incredibly busy day and it's an extraordinary time to be having this conversation, but uh, we're very grateful for the work that you do and your committee as well in, in scrutinizing these incredibly important matters at the most important time in our history, in a sense, for, for reshaping our identity in this kind of way. And uh, so we hope to speak with you again soon, maybe on the other side of the, this first phase of the pandemic, as things start to progress with the committee. But for now, thank you very much, Tom. Thank you very much, and perhaps next time in person. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you. Bye-bye.